that was a trailer for Cheatin', and uh, I guess we should introduce the man himself, two-time Oscar-nominated uh, filmmaker, Bill Plimpton. Thanks a lot for doing this, Adam. Sure, sure, happy to do it. Uh, yeah, I guess before we, uh, because I'm sure a lot of people in the audience and uh, listening, uh, you know, at home, uh, listening to the podcast, they may not know much about your latest film, Cheatin'. Why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, this film, uh, the story, and where the idea for it came sure. from? Uh, it actually comes from a relationship I had about 15 years ago uh, with this woman that I was madly in love with. And we moved in together, everything was nice, until about a month uh, we wanted to strangle each other. And I thought the ironic thing was, even though we wanted to kill each other, we still wanted to have sex. And I thought the idea of, of those two opposite emotions um, encapsulated in the same relationship was a really funny idea. Right. So I, I wanted to make a film showing this, this dichotomy between love and hate and how close they are. Right. The passions of love and hate are really pretty close. That's true. Uh, tell us a little bit about the, uh, the characters in the film and sort of uh, what what inspired you? What types of films inspired uh, you to make Cheat? Well, um, James M. Cain is one of my favorite writers. Um, uh, actually, he's not one of my favorite writers, but his films are some of my favorite films. I've re been reading a bunch of his books. They're not really that interesting. Uh, they're not really that great. But the films that he's been doing, you know, like uh, uh, Double Indemnity and, and Postman Always Rings Twice and Mildred Pierce are some of my favorite films. They're very noirish very dark, everybody's evil, nobody's really good. And I like that, I like that, that those kind of characters and the, the, the film noir kind of effect. Sure. So I wanted to put that in the film, but also it has a kind of a European flavor. The music, which you just heard from Nicole Reynaud, um, she does wonderful music and she's worked with me on a bunch of my films. And, um, so, and also there's no dialogue in the film. I don't like dialogue, it's hard for me to write dialogue. So I figure it's kind of unique to tell a story with visual imagery and just people's faces and their emotions and their movement. And uh, it's much more poetic that way. So I wanted to tell a story without dialogue. And also it's much easier to sell overseas simply because there's no dubbing or sure. subtitle or anything like that. Yeah. So uh, it's really, um, it's a very different kind of film. And I don't know if you plan to ask this question or not, but it's, I've had really a lot of difficulty uh, selling this film, uh, getting it in, in movie theaters, simply because it's not a kiddie film and it's, uh, it's not a computer animated film. And so you can see it's all hand drawn it, and I did it all myself. So that's, that's one of the things that bugs me about um, distribution in the US is that, that stereotype that animation can't be for grown-ups. Right. And yeah. ho hopefully this film will break that stereotype. Yeah, I, I think it will. Uh, and if you look at the style, it's, uh, this is your seventh animated feature yes. film. And you've obviously done, um, you know, I think almost 100 short films uh, and your seventh animated feature. Uh, but this one actually has a different look and feel. Uh, tell, tell us about how this is different from your previous features and, sure. and sort of the, you know, the process that that you took to, to get that look on, on film. Right. Well, I actually brought a portfolio of some of the original art. So uh, the signing table, I don't know where it's going to be. When you come to get your drawing, uh, check out the artwork. It's all pencil. Actually, you know what? I can flip it, flip it open real quick here. It's all pencil on paper. And it's really uh, the lowest of low tech. It's really simple, uh, simple drawings. And it's a kind of, um, here we are. Uh, oh, that's the wrong film. <laughs> <laughs> that's Idiots and Angels, I yeah, think. Yeah, the other page. Yeah. The other page is that. Yeah. But basically, it's just, uh, first thing I do, I do, I did an outline, like three-page outline of what the order of the scenes will be. And then I'll do a, a storyboard, but it's a very minimal storyboard. The drawings are that big. They're not so big. And then I'll do uh, a more elaborate storyboard. And to me, the f final storyboard is really the... Uh, the best part of the film. That's the magic. If it looks good in the final storyboard, I think it's going to, the film's going to be a success. Because all the questions are answered there. You have you know, the story, obviously. You have the editing. You have the uh, costuming, the character design, the backgrounds, the shadowing, the uh, lens, the, uh, the uh, lighting, 
uh, it's really all resolved in, in that storyboard. And then once I have that, then I just go and start doing the drawings. And uh, for this one, there are about 1,000 shots, something like that, and um, almost 40,000 drawings, something like 40,000 drawings. So it's a lot of drawings. But I get up early in the morning, like 8 o'clock, uh, 7 o'clock, and I draw uh, all day long. Right. So I, I do about 100 drawings a day. That's, that's very impressive. Yeah, well, uh, they're fun to draw. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, the, the look of the film, too, it has a very painterly look, almost a watercolor look. Um, so after you're finished drawing, uh, what, what then happens? Uh, obviously, the artwork is scanned, and then yeah. you have a team that, uh, of artists that help you to kind of give it that look, right? Yeah, I don't want to get too technical, but, yeah. well, actually, it's, it's a technical place. Yeah. I guess I can. Yeah. Um, but I, uh, in the past, I used a regular Rostrum camera, 35 millimeter Mitchell, and I did all the films on um, cells, painted right. cells. And that was very expensive, laborious, and, and it didn't look so good. Yeah. Uh, so f for my first dog film, Guard Dog, which was nominated for an Oscar, uh, my staff convinced me to scan the drawings and composite them digitally. And that was such a change. I had more freedom to work with the artwork. Uh, it was faster. It was so much cheaper. And so I, that was uh, like 2005, I think. Yeah. So since then, I've been scanning my art. So now I do a stack of drawings like this. I give them to my producer, and she has them scanned, uh, cleaned, uh, colored, composited, and then uh, it's a film. It's a movie film. That's great. Well, why don't we take a look at one of uh, the first clips for uh, Cheatin', and uh, it's about, I think, two minutes, and then we'll, we'll talk some more. Okay. All right? Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I should have set this piece up. Um, this is a part of the story where we uh, meet Ella, who's the star of the film, and we find out that she is, hasn't found love yet. She's looking for love, and that's why her heart is so small. So this is actually a dream sequence uh, that um, explains her predicament, how she really wants to fall in love very badly. And that sets it up. And this is one of my favorite parts of the film because it's really, it's about pure drawing, just pencil on paper. And it, it really, there's no need for dialogue. It's all very clearly explained in the visuals. And that's why I like this part. Yeah, so it's much. one of my favorite sequences from the film. Uh, I've seen it many times yeah. now and uh, it, it's just such a beautiful sequence and it just it, it, it almost can stand alone too you know it's, yes. it's a beautiful part of the film and it, obviously in context but it's such a great just standalone piece uh, all on its own I think so yeah and the, and the music is by uh, Nicole Reynaud again who uh, pretty much scored the whole film yeah yeah she did a great job um, you know just looking at that you know I just it just every time I look at your work I just think about how much you know how many man hours go into this? Uh, you know, going back, like how long have you been working on this film? Like how, how many you know, years has it taken to well, get to this point? Uh, usually my films take about three years, two and a half sometimes. Uh, this one took a lot longer because after I got started on it, I met these French producers who said, oh yeah, we'll get you a couple million dollars to make the film. We'll find some money in France. And uh, I waited a couple years and they never produced the, the, the money. So I said, forget it, I'm going to finish the film without you, which is what I did. Right. Um, uh, what, what happened was, the, um, and you asked this question earlier, yeah. the look of the film is very unique from my other films. It's kind of a watercolor and cross-hatching look that is very uh, similar to my illustration technique when I was doing magazine illustrations. Right. And I love that look. It was so gorgeous. And so uh, when I discovered this for, for this film, I fell in love with it. I said, yeah, let's go with it. However, uh, we needed more people. Hire, we had to hire more people, four more artists, to do this very uh, technical watercolor effect. I think it's After Effects. I, I could be wrong. Yeah, I think they, you know, it was a combination of you know, Photoshop for the coloring and then After Effects for the compositing. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah, I don't know much about it. <laughs> I just do the drawings and say, yeah, yeah make a film. And... Um, <laughs> But the problem was I ran out of money. Right. Uh, I was uh, six months to completion and I was broke. In fact, I was in debt, deep debt. So we went to, uh, to Kickstarter and we'd done that before. And actually you were the one that ran, ran the Kickstarter campaign. That's right. yeah. And if you have any questions about Kickstarter, this is the guy. I mean, he's a genius with Kickstarter. He knows how to, 
how to milk it. It really does. <laughs> uh, we asked for 75000 We got over $100,000. Yeah. So we were very happy with the Kickstarter. Yeah. And that money made me, got me right to the very last day. And then it was gone. Right. So right. it just worked out pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's, uh, I have to say that when it comes to Kickstarter, it helps to have somebody that is an icon that people <laughs> really, really, really enjoy um, supporting. So I think, yeah. it, it, you know, uh, I was going to ask this, but I think Kickstarter is actually a perfect type of platform for somebody like you, uh, an independent filmmaker that is truly independent. Uh, you've managed to stay independent for, you know, 40 plus years. Yeah, yeah. Um, have you ever been... Uh, enticed to go mainstream or to work for a big animation studio? Has that ever... Well, a there's this story, this famous story. You want me to tell the, sure, yeah. the, the Disney story? Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how many people heard the Disney story? A couple, okay. But <laughs> well, there's a lot of people listening uh, you That's know, right. at home. More so than people, yeah. They might not have heard it. So. Um, well, what happened was uh, when I was a kid, uh, 14 or 15, I sent a packet of drawings to Disney hoping to get their attention. And they wrote a nice letter, a rejection letter back, and I kind of forgot about it. But when I got nominated for an Oscar back in 1987 right. with uh, Your Face, uh, animation was coming back now. Disney had just done the, the um, Little Mermaid and Lion King, and all of a sudden they discovered there's a lot of money in animation. So they sent a lawyer to my, uh, my studio. It wasn't my studio, it was my home, actually. And a nice suit and tie and a big briefcase. He sits me down, he looks at me, he says, Walt Disney wants to offer you a million dollars to come work for us. I go, wow, finally <laughs> they discovered my talent. They know, you know, that, yeah. that I'm the guy for them. I'm right. the, the big Disney animator. Because I love Disney. I wouldn't be here today without Disney. But, you know, they say negotiating with Disney is not so much good cop, bad cop, but bad cop antichrist. And I think there's some, some truth to that. Uh, for example, I said, well, you know, I'd love to work for Disney. Can I still make my quirky little films on the weekend? Yeah. They said, yeah, you can do that, but Disney will own them. I said, well, what about if I tell someone a funny story? Well, Disney owns that. Uh, what if I have a dream? Oh, that's Disney's. <laughs> and so I just felt like, I don't know if this is the yeah. right fit, you know, even though the million dollars is very enticing. Um, and they didn't tell me what they wanted me for. I had no idea. I only found out later they wanted me to do the genie in Aladdin, that crazy Robin Williams character. So I said, no, I turned down a million bucks uh, to Disney. But I don't get a lot of those offers, just so you know. <laughs> uh, in fact, I haven't had one since. Right, right. Uh, but they, they always invite me out there. I lecture to their people. I've done Pixar, I've done DreamWorks, I've done um, uh, Nickelodeon, and they, 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 they respect me. But I think they're, they're afraid that I'll put some sexy boobs in there or something raunchy and you know, get them in trouble. Right, right. Well, I think it's, it's very admirable, and I think that, to be honest, a lot of your fans appreciate the fact that you've stayed independent and you didn't go that route because uh, you've created such incredible work in the past, you know, 20 plus years yeah. since that offer was made. So well, thank you. Uh, it would be nice to, to have a nice big house. But uh, sure, sure. But uh, it's a but choice yeah. I made. I th and as I said before, I think that's why you were able to be successful with Kickstarter because uh, your fans know that you are fighting the good fight. You know, you're, you're really, you're, you're a man of the people and you're a true independent artist. And, and that's what I think people that want to back projects, uh, crowdfunding projects, that's what they want to see. They want to see yeah. somebody that, that truly does need the support. You know, there's been a lot of backlash with other, you know, well-known directors I and celebrities that, yeah. using Kickstarter, um, but you never had any. There wasn't a single person that had anything negative to say about <laughs> using Kickstarter. Nothing but support and just admiration. So, as I said, it was uh, a very um, enjoyable experience, kind of helping you raise funds through Kickstarter, uh, and uh, you know, hopefully, we'll do it again soon. I hope so. so. Um, yeah. So, you know, going back, you know, uh, in history, you, you talked about how Disney was, you know that you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Disney. Yeah. Who, what are some of your other kind of animation influences? Who do you Well, there's uh, a really lot admire? of influences, not necessarily animation. Okay, yeah. But, you know, people like Art Crumb and Milton Glaser, Tommy Younger, um, uh, Carlos Nine, who's a South American illustrator, uh, certainly Tex Avery, Bob Clampett, Walt Disney, um, 
Um, Marv Newland is a big influence. There's a lot of really great animators out there. You know, I love some of the, the Pixar animation and the DreamWorks. I love uh, How to Train Your Dragon. I think that's a, an epic film. It's really marvelous. Uh, and then there's an animated film called Mind Game. It's a Japanese film that never got distribution in the U.S. And uh, it, it, it's one of my favorite. I think it's a Citizen Kane of animation. It's really, really genius. Uh, Thomas Hart Benton is a big influence. N.C. Wyeth, some illustrators. Um, you know, I go everywhere. Uh, Goy, Francisco Goya. Yeah. Uh, I steal everywhere. That's what's so weird is that people think my style is very original right. and unique when, in fact, I steal from all these people and kind of mix it around. But I think all the greats do, you know, look at so. Quentin Tarantino, you know, yeah, okay. he's borrowing from so many. Yeah. You know, and I he, steal from him too. You do, you, and, <laughs> and he's a fan of yours. So, yes, you're right. Uh, you're uh, right. Tell them about uh, the little, um, I guess, the homage he paid to you uh, in Kill oh, Bill. Oh, right, right, yeah. right. Well, Kill Bill, if you've seen Kill Bill, uh, the bride, Uma Thurman, yeah. it marries uh, Mr. Plimpton. Right. And I saw him at a festival in Europe and I said, Hey, you know, where'd you get this Plimpton name, Quentin? He said, oh, that's you, man, that's you, <laughs> dude. And it's spelled the same way, it's right? spelled the same way, P-L-Y. Because some people yeah. spell P-L-I-M, right? right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's, yeah. see, that's the, the best form of flattery, I it's, think. Yeah, it's you know? wonderful, yeah, be immortalized uh, in a Tarantino film. Yeah, exactly. And you have a lot of, um, you know, well-established, you know, live-action directors who really do Mm -hmm. um, cite you as someone uh, that has influenced them. Yeah, it's always amazing because I really get no respect in Hollywood yeah. and, and it's really hard to get anything uh, done there. Yeah. So that's why I stay in New York. I like, I like New York. Yeah. I mean, you are, uh, you know, we're here at the New York Apple Store and you are a quintessential New York artist. I mean, do you, do you, could you see yourself working anywhere else or is New York really... At this point now, uh, I really like New York. I'm very settled in. Um, I, you know what I love about New York is walking down the streets and all the weird people. In L.A., you run into nobody on the sidewalks. Here, there's like three or four great ideas every block. Right. And I'm always writing down ideas. I see a funny costume. Well, the guard dog film, yeah. that was inspired by a dog I saw on the, uh, barking at a bird. Oh. And I thought, wow, that's a great idea. And yeah, I, yeah. I, I, wrote, I wrote it from that. So, yeah, New York City is very inspirational. It's very... Um, uh, electric, right? And I get a lot of great ideas here. Yeah, it's true. I think cities like Los Angeles are such, you know, it's a, such a car culture that, you know, you don't interact with people in the same yeah, way. You, you know, sure you don't. just kind of go from your house to your car to your, you know, to, and you're isolated, and then you right, get out right. to your office or whatever, and that's it. You know, yeah. you just, so uh, why don't we watch another clip? Yeah, uh, good from idea. Cheating and Do you want me to set this up? Yeah. This what is, is it? the second one? Um, I think it's where are my notes? Opera. 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 Yeah. Okay. That's right. Uh, this is a scene where Ella and Jake fall in love, and I wanted to do something that was really romantic to show how deep their romance was. This is like Romeo and Juliet times 10. So I wanted to have a song. It's a, a German drinking song, I think. And, uh, and this is sort of their fantasy romance. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a couple things about this film. Uh, it was inspired by Yellow Submarine, the, uh, col the bright colors and the flat colors and the, the kind of um, psychedelic uh, use of dancing and color. Uh, also, dancing, if you're an animator, I don't know if there are any animators here, is one of the hardest things to animate. It's really difficult because there's so many changes in perspective and, 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 and uh, size and, and right. emotion. And, uh, but when you do it right, it really feels Fabulous, and this one I think I, I, I really had it's, a great yeah, time. Yes, it's on, another on beautiful scene. You know, every time I rewatch these things, I'm just like, oh, and that's, that's my favorite. You know, there's just so <laughs> many great sequences, and uh, you know, so you know, just you watch it and you really realize that um, that you couldn't really capture that in in computer animation. What yeah. you've done there, I just don't see. And I think even we just had a press screening of Cheatin' on Tuesday, and one critic said something to the effect of. Uh, Bill Plimpton, Plimpton's new film puts Pixar films to shame or something. So <laughs> I just thought that was such an interesting quote because, you know, they're all talking about what you're doing as, as if it's so new and original, but right, right. You're, you're doing yeah. the original form of animation, you know, yeah, and, uh, exactly. uh, which, you know, reminded me that, you know, a few years ago you worked on a film where you restored an old Windsor McKay film. Right, right. Uh, I thought it might be interesting to, to hear from your perspective, 
the role that Windsor McKay played for people that don't know yeah, that was in a kind of the uh, birth of traditional hand-drawn animation. I'm glad you brought that up because he's really one of my in major influences. He was the turn of the century, I mean last century. Yeah. Uh, 1914 was when his, his film started coming out. He did uh, Gertie the Dinosaur or um, uh, the Little Nemo in Slumberland, right, which right. is... The what comic strip famous? series yeah, comic that he did strip. for... Uh, and he was a brilliant animator. He was like me. He did all the drawings himself, his own stories. Very surreal, uh, not necessarily uh, used uh, dialogue. Well, he couldn't use dialogue. There was no dialogue. Right, there was right silent there. film, yeah. But yeah. So he was a big influence. But uh, for that film, we used Kickstarter right. to raise money for it. Because there's a lot of work to clean this last film he did called The Flying House. Every frame had to be digitally clean. And that uh, took a hell of a lot of work. Um, I'm going to break for one second. Yeah, sure. Is there anybody here who donated a Kickstarter for Cheatin? Oh, we got Couple two people, people here. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. Let's give him a big hand. Yeah, 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 yeah. Bob, you didn't donate to Kickstarter? You did. Okay, we're three people. Three people. Okay. Good. Um, but yeah, that helped uh, sure. be able to to make the flying house, and it was such a good experience. Uh, the flying house that yeah. we did it again for uh, cheating. Right, right. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a great. Um, uh, the flying house really is a great piece of history, and it was so good to see it kind of restored and just you know made in a way you kind of reimagined it so that it could it could um, kind of inspire and and educate a new generation of people, which I thought was really um, you know. Despite some criticisms, I thought it was yeah, a really uh, yeah. uh, it was a very noble controversial. Effort. <laughs> very controversial. <laughs> yeah. We had uh, Matthew Modine and um, uh, Patricia, Clarkson. Patricia Clarkson do the voices because obviously there are no voices back in 1920. Right. So it really, really gave it some some meaning. Right. Right. Yeah. So if you're uh, an aspiring animator and you haven't seen the works of uh, Windsor McKay, you really have to. You have to go back. This predates Walt Disney. He yeah. really is the father. You know, yes. Bill's the king of indie animation, but Windsor <laughs> McKay is the father of, of, of yeah, animation. So it's, true. everyone should, should know his work. Um, so, you know, this film, Cheatin', is, uh, it has been playing in film festivals all over the world. And uh, tell us a little bit about that journey. You know, I, I think it's won quite a number of prizes. Mm -hmm. um, how has that experience been, and uh, where, where is it going next? Uh, yeah, the film was finished about two years ago, actually, and so we wanted to do the festival circuit, hoping to pick up uh, distributors. We got we got in the Slam Dance, we played in Annecy, we played, uh, you know, maybe 100 festivals all over the world. We've won, uh, I think, 16 or 17 international prizes, so it's done very well. It got European uh, distribution in France. We played in over 100 cinemas, got rave reviews. Uh, but again, the, the, the U.S. distributors, you know, hands off, they, couldn't, they didn't want to touch it. One distributor came to me and said, he's a friend of mine, he's, and he handles some of Tarantino's films. He said, well, you know, there's nudity in your film, Bill, like I'd killed somebody. I, mean, yeah. I don't know what, why you can't have nudity in a, in a feature film. And it's because it was animated, they felt that I was... I was ruining some sacred uh, art form, you know, right. I was destroying a sacred art form. So As if animation is only for children, for children yeah. and that it's not an art form that can, can branch out to, you know, I, we were talking about this the other day too, that we can't even call it adult animation because no. that has a negative connotation, so yeah. what, what, do you, what do you call it? And we were sort of joking, oh, it's a, animation for grown-ups, you know, yeah. that's like the least, you know, uh, uh, kind of, I guess, Insulting, yeah, insulting way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Well, what really bugs me is these animators at Pixar and DreamWorks. I know a lot of them. Yeah, they have sorted lives like everybody else. They think about sleazy stuff yeah. and you know uh, having affairs and getting divorced and things like that. Yet they're not allowed to make films that deal with their day-to-day -day lives. Right. They're only forced to make films about kitty stuff, animals and little songs and, right. and innocent things. Yeah. And it just seems, it seems like they're lying. They can't tell the truth about their lives. Right. And or they have two lives. They have their, yeah. their real life in this kind of job, you know, where, they, right. where they're selling, you know, personified objects for children. Right, right, you know? right, so, right. Yeah. I understand. So I, I, even though I don't get rich on my films, I feel comfortable making stories that people need to see about you know my own life or friends of mine, people who I, uh, you know, I hear stories from. I say that'd be a great idea for a film. 
Yeah. Well, despite all the uh, kind of difficulty, uh, the film is finally coming out in theaters yes. here in the U.S., so let's talk about that. Uh, it opens first uh, this, uh, sorry, next Friday, April 3rd, at the Village East Cinemas yep. for one week. Yep. And then after that, what happens? You're going to be, I think, going on a very intensive nationwide tour. Yeah, uh, we, yeah. I think we're seeing uh, 15 cities, something yeah. like that, uh, starting in New York and then Chicago, Minneapolis, right. and then the West Coast tour. Um, I've done it before. It's really a lot of work. Yeah. It's very difficult. I'm away from home for a long time. But I think I believe in this film so much, I think it's important that I go out and sell it. And I, I, I offer everybody free drawings, just like I'm doing here. I've done probably a thousand drawings of, that, of the characters by now. Yeah. Uh, and um, I, I like to be in touch with my fans. It's really great to see people who, who recognize my work and appreciate my work and are uh, supportive of my work. And th this film is being self-distributed. We're four-walling in, uh, in East Village, so we really need people to turn out. We will be handing out cards with all the information afterwards. Yep. So it's, it's, uh, it's sink or swim for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's, it, to be able to see a Bill Plimpton film in a, in a big, dark cinema is still the best way. Yeah. So I, I, I'd also encourage everyone here to, to come out on April 3rd on opening night, and uh, there may be some other you know, goodies that you can yes. win if you show up early. So, uh, you know, come support the film. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Bill's uh, almost your entire catalog is coming out on iTunes as yes. well. Yes. Uh, I think on April 1st. So just to coincide with all of this, um, yeah. almost all of your work. Yeah. Well, for a long time, it didn't make sense to me to, to release my stuff on the, on, on the Internet. Yeah. I'll tell you why. I was making a lot of sales to schools and libraries and TV, especially all over the world. And so anytime we saw one of my films, whether it's Your Face or Guard Dog, online, we would send a polite letter saying, please pull it down. You don't have the rights to show it. Well, uh, now the, 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 the balance, the scales are changing. And it seems to be a lot more money on, online. So I decided to, um, to really uh, get the stuff out there. And it, it, it wasn't good for me because the, uh, nobody knew who I was. Nobody was aware of my work. I used to be on MTV all the time, and, and uh, the people knew me there. But now the MTV doesn't show my stuff. Right. Uh, so now I'm really happy to be online, and now all of a sudden people say, oh, yeah, this is the Bill Plimpton guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah let's, let's check him out. And you're doing that through a partnership with uh, Schwartz International. Yes, yeah. Schwartz International. So they're helping My whole it. library, uh, about 14 hours of uh, animation. So it's Incredible, pretty, pretty yeah. extensive. Yeah, yeah, so if you haven't uh, seen you know, some of the work dating back, I think, almost 30 years, yeah. um, this is going to be your chance. You know, some of these films, I think, haven't been available outside of the festival circuit um, exactly. in a long time. So it's going to be it's, a It's a treasure trove. You're going to discover films that that uh, have rarely been seen. Yeah. And so it's, it's really uh, something you can um, uh, sink your teeth into. And, it, and also, in, uh, I think, the best possible quality that you know, yes. could be found. So uh, you know, it's, it's a great chance to see them in a higher you know, quality than has probably yeah. been available uh, since yeah. they were originally released. Yeah, so. that's true. Yeah, it's great. So why don't we take a look at one last clip, and then we will uh, open up to questions from the audience. Uh, All right. Yeah, uh, let me set that one up too. Sure. The, this is when uh, Ella, who's the, the heroine of the film, uh, finds out that her husband has been cheating on him. And so she hires a hitman to, to kill him. And uh, this is the hitman getting ready for the, uh, for the, uh, the, 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 the killing. And one of the, my favorite parts was the nipple scene. <laughs> and that really wasn't in the storyboard, uh, that, that whole transformation. And when I was drawing the nipple uh, with a staple in it, I thought, God, it looks like a face. And then I got, came to the, right there when I was drawing it, like, wouldn't this be great to have it uh, transform into the guy screaming, the, the, the nipple? So we call it the, the screaming nipple scene, which we think would be a great name for a rock band. The screaming nipples, don't you think that'd be? Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, let's take some questions. Okay, one here so much your films from many many decades now but in, in terms of sound not music when which comes first sometimes when you're drawing do you imagine the sound of like a you know a boat skimming over the water and how how is that like 
in your imagination. How exciting is that to think about sound when you're drawing? Oh, the sound effects. Yeah, sound effects yeah. and how that it, it stimulates your drawing. Yes, uh, not so much, not so much. Occasionally it will. Um, I'm trying to think of a occasion when it does, but uh, no, generally it's, it's all the visuals, the visuals, and then the sound guy, Western Fonger, will come in with the cool sound effects. Do you think this more classical side of animation, this, you know, I wouldn't call it traditional, but a lot of people would, uh, do you think it's making a comeback in culture right now as far as what's being played? Uh, I wish that was true. I don't think so. I, I really think that uh, drawing films is, um, is looked down upon by Hollywood and a lot of the theater owners. Um, uh, I, I hope I'm wrong, but um, I go to, I teach a lot of film, uh, or lecture a lot of film studios, uh, I'm sorry, film schools, and they're cutting out their drawing classes and replace them with uh, 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 programs, uh, digital programming, and that seems to be the future. But, you know, I, I think that there's room for everybody. I think Japanese still do uh, traditional drawing, and some of the TV shows still do drawings. So it's not all computer animation. But, um, yeah, I really hope that uh, uh, drawing, you know, con continues to, to be a, a, in major films. I think uh, it's, it's really sad that if that happens, if they stop teaching drawing, because I think some of the best computer animators still are terrific traditional artists, you know, they yeah. know they could animate it by hand. And they hate doing yeah. computer stuff. I hate right. to say it in Apple here, but uh, they really want to do traditional animation, but the, the powers of beef believe there's no market for hand-drawn animation. Do you have any ideas marinating in your head for another feature? <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a couple films I'm, I'm actually almost done with. One of them is called Hitler's Folly. And it's about Adolf Hitler being an animator, cartoonist, and uh, not really caring about the war and just doing funny cartoons. And um, then uh, another one is called Revengeance, and you can find that online. And uh, I'm doing it with Jim Lujan, who is a wonderful animator guy, a cartoonist guy, and we're doing it together. He's writing it, and then I'm doing all the animation. Hey, Bill. Hi. <laughs> not really a question, but... Um... You know, I remember as a, as a kid just watching Liquid TV and what it was like working with those guys, you know, the Ren and Stimpy, the Beavis right. and Butthead back in the day. And if you missed that, because that was some of your... Yeah, I do, because uh, MTV was so pervasive. Uh, as well, it still is pervasive. But back then, it was the hottest channel. And I was the hot guy at MTV. I mean, they had me do all their award show animations, and, and I did uh, a lot of... Um, uh, channel comments and things like that and it was really uh, fun working there I, I mean I would go to Russia and I'd see my stuff in Russian television or I'd go to Finland and see it there so I still do some music videos I, I do um, um, you know the Kanye West thing you saw and, uh, and Weird Al Yankovic and that's kind of similar to MTV but it's not as as important as pervasive, pervasive as MTV um, Bill, how, how did you make your transition from cartoonist to animator? What was what kicked that off? Mm -hmm. uh, did you all hear the question? Yeah. Uh, I started out wanting to be an animator. That was my first love. I wanted to be like Walt Disney or Windsor McKay. And unfortunately, when I got out of school, uh, high school, there were no uh, animation schools. So I couldn't really study animation. So I moved to New York and became an illustrator. I did uh, gag cartoons, political cartoons, caricatures, things like that. And then, um, but I still had that urge to be an animator. But the thing about illustration that helped me a lot was I did a lot of sequential cartoons where they were um, uh, like a storyboard. And also I had to draw very quickly and come up with funny ideas very quickly. And those, uh, those talents came in uh, very uh, uh, valuable it became very valuable when I was a, became an animator. And, you know, once I did animation, I'll tell you another story here. Uh, how much time do we have? One minute? One question, okay. Uh, okay. Um, when I did Your Face, which is the first film I really did on my own, there was a screening in New York with a, called a CIFA, and they showed it there. 
And I was this new guy. I mean, I'd been an illustrator, but I'd never done animation before. And I was about 35 then. And so there was all these big name New York animators in the crowd, and I was in the back. I was so embarrassed because the film was so, so, I don't know, dorky. It was a really dorky film. Just a guy's head singing a song. And as soon as that came on, after about three or four seconds, people started to laugh. And I can't tell you the, 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 the feeling in my body. It's like crack cocaine. I, my, my whole body just lit up hearing a group of people laugh at my films. Because I never had that when I was doing print, because it went out in magazines and newspapers, and maybe they laughed at home, maybe they didn't. And after the, sc the screening, people came up to me and said, are you Bill Plimpton? Did you do that, your face film? I said, yeah, that was me. And they said, well, let's go out and have a drink and talk animation. And I felt like, damn, I'm home. This is what I should have been you know, when I was out of school. And so I never tur uh, turned back. I, the next day, I called all my magazine and newspaper clients. I said, I'm quitting, I'm quitting print. I'm going into animation. And they said, are you nuts? Animation's dead. Nobody does animation anymore. You're going to you know, go broke. But I did uh, you know, 25 Ways to Quit Smoking, How to Kiss, one of those days. And they were all big successes. Your Face got nominated for an Oscar. I was selling to MTV. And it just really just took off from there. Yeah, so it was an easy, it was a very fun transfer. That, that doesn't happen a lot, that your first film is such a big success. It's very rare. Hi, Bill. How are you? Hi, um, good. I wanted to ask you, what was your experience like at the International Society of Caricature Artists, and what advice do you have to those up-and-coming caricature artists? Um, I like doing caricature art. I mean, that's the essence of animation, is doing caricature. Uh, I did caricatures for about 15 years. I did all the, the, all the politicians, all the you know, music stars. I was syndicated by um, uh, Universal Press, and they syndicated my cartoon strips. But I really wasn't that successful because, um, I don't know, my heart was still in animation. I didn't really you know, commit to, to doing caricature. But the essence of good uh, animation is caricature. You have to know what to exaggerate, what not to exaggerate, how much to exaggerate it. Um, and how to, how to draw the human face. And if you can draw the human face and do a caricature, you'll be a great animator. All right, great. Well, Bill, thank you so much. Again, sure. come see Cheaton uh, at the Village East Cinema starting uh, April 3rd, next Friday, a week from tomorrow. Week from tomorrow, and, yeah. Uh, this is the yeah, anniversary it's, here. It's coming.